please rise for the invocation by council member Danny Stevens. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow and nurture the bonds of community. Fill us with your grace as we make decisions that affect the citizens of Hickory. And continue to remind us that all we do here today, all that we accomplish, is for the pursuit of truth. For the greater glory of you and for the service of humanity, we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We thank all of you for your indulgence for a little bit of a late start. That doesn't happen very often, as you know. But we had a special meeting uh, at 6. And uh, a, little, a little snug getting back here and getting started. Uh, special presentation by the library. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll ask uh, Miss Lisa Neal, the... Uh Children's Services Coordinator at Patrick Beaver Library to come to the podium and she's going to tell us about the great program they ran. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members and Mr. Barry. I appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you some of the really exciting and fun things that we had going on at the library this summer. Your first question may be why summer reading? Why do we pour so much money and effort and love and time and sweat into summertime reading for the kids. Um, our main goal is to inspire lifelong learning and instill a true love of reading in all our children. Not assigned reading, not reading they have to take a test on, but reading that they do because they love it and they want to do it every day. The focus is on fun because reading is one of those fun things that they can do. And there's a lot of competing interests for kids entertainment time, TVs, movies, whatever. So we want to give children the power over their own reading and have them learn to love to read because they want to. Another reason is the summer slide. Uh, summer slide is the loss of achievement that takes place when kids do not read or have access to books over the summer. Children who do, do not read lose two or three months worth of academic achievement over the summer and they do not catch up when they go back in the fall. They try to catch up, and they move up a little bit, and the teachers try to get them to catch up, but they don't. And that summer loss is cumulative. So by the end of fifth grade, going into sixth grade, students who have not been um, exposed to and have quick, easy access to books throughout their summers can be up to three years behind their other classmates simply because of their summer slide. And research estimates that 50 to 67% of the achievement gap for children living in poverty is the result of summer learning loss because of no access to books. As you can see here, the red line on the bottom is children from low-income homes with no access to books. And their reading scores in the fall, when they go back, go down. The same low-income kids who have easy access to books over the summers is the blue line, and their reading scores go way up. So the difference is not income, the difference is books. Books beats the summer slide. There's summer school, but that focuses on remediation, instruction, and public libraries focus on enrichment and instilling that lifelong love of learning. Experts say that the reading achievement gap seen in ninth grade students can be traced back to unequal access to summer learning opportunities during the elementary school years. So a library card can make a huge difference in a child's life. And by the way, this was her first library card and she was very excited. <laughs> we also provide um, computer liter literacy skills. There are a lot of households in Catawba County where they do not have internet computer access at home and it is an essential part of a child's education now. It's in the core curriculum for kindergarten that they must have computer skills. 
and they must learn those. And a lot of the um, two and three year olds get on the computers at the library on a regular basis and they learn how to move the mouse and move this and click and our, our theme this year was Every Hero Has a Story. And they had a reading log where they kept track of the time that they spent either reading or listening to someone read to them. And this was the teen thing so that it didn't look quite so childish. Each of those sections counted for five hours of reading time. And each of those sections would earn the child one free book to keep forever and ever. So, each child who signed up for summer reading could earn up to four free books. We also had eight busy weeks of programming because we want to get them in the library, we want them to have fun, we want them to associate the library with a fun, exciting, wonderful place to be. So we do all kinds of crazy things. We started off with an indie rock band that gave a concert. Um, they're called Lunch Money out of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, dancing Stories with April Turner. She does stories and dances and music from African culture. We brought in a mind reader. He's amazing. I don't know how he does it, but he does it every time. Puppet shows, music, jugglers, comedy acts, storytellers, of course. The balloon lady is a storyteller. But it's not just school-age kids either. Research has shown that the first five years of life, even the first three years of life, are essential in brain development and learning pre-literacy skills. Kids need to learn a lot of things before they can even begin to learn the alphabet and learn how to read. So we have story times for all ages. We have baby time for kids who aren't walking yet, uh, toddler time, preschool story times. We have five story times a week. We also have therapy dogs. So kids who are reluctant readers or pet lovers can come in and sit down and spend 15 minutes reading to a dog. Early literacy skills are essential. And if you don't get started in the early years, it makes it harder and harder for kids to learn how to read. And if you have trouble with reading, you have trouble with every single subject. Obviously, in preschool, the teachers of these children are their parents, their caregivers, their neighbors, their grandmothers. And the library plays an essential part in providing those parents and caregivers with the tools, with the knowledge, with the support um, to know how to help their children develop to their best and um, support the early literacy skills and teach them and get their kids ready for school. And these are the things parents do, and it seems very simple, and, and parents do this all the time, but if they understand how doing it a certain way or doing it um, every day makes such a big difference, it, it makes a big difference. So we also have lots of fun activities. We did crafts every Monday afternoon, kind of stuck with the superhero theme, and we made masks and capes and badges and... This was some paper beads that I think someone's daughter particularly enjoyed making. Um, duct tape creations, and of course the 4th of July, the parade that we have every year. Um, this was the sing-along, and the crawdads came, and some players came. It's a big family event and very well attended, several hundred people. And the kids decorate their bikes and their scooters and themselves, and they parade around the salt block. Did a cartooning workshop. And as you can see, it was quite successful. We had to pull chairs out of the closet and books off the shelves for kids to use as laptop tables because they were sitting all over the floor. Story times, we have a magician come in. And it might seem that a lot of this is just entertainment, and to a certain extent it is. Um, but the, the performers who perform in the libraries in the summer are always very mindful of where they are and will for example, that magician made a big point of talking about you know, his, his magic and the kids were all ooing and eyeing. He said, you know how I learned how to do that? Right through that door, there's a book that can teach you how to do that. Are all of these local people that are doing these? Or? No. Okay. There's a few of them are, but. Okay. <laughs> um, local to North Carolina, mostly. 
puppet shows. Um, Books and Balls was a program we did in collaboration with um, Parks and Rec. It's a program that Parks and Rec runs, and the like Carol from the Ridgeview Library goes over and reads to them and does literacy, literacy activities with the kids in their summer program. Brought in Game Truck. It's a big truck out of Charlotte that comes in and they've cleared out the back of it. One side is a leather bench and the other side is screens and the kids get on there and play video games. There's a game coach to get the party going. And because it's a truck and it's limited in the number of kids who could participate, they had to do something extra to earn their ticket onto the game truck. So they had to either draw a cartoon, or write a poem, or build a model robot out of ordinary household items, or paint a portrait of a superhero. And they did, and all the tickets sold out, and it was a great time. It was a back-to-school trivia competition. Our reading records only went to 20 hours of reading. Our focus is to get kids to read a little bit every day, not to get kids to sit down and read four hours every day, or, you know, six hours or whatever. We don't need them to read hour after hour after hour after hour. A little bit every day will do the trick. So at the end of the 20 hours, they had finished, and some of the kids finished that in two weeks. So we had super readers where they would earn the recognition of putting their name up on the wall, plus um, they could enter a drawing to be in one of our read posters, which some of you may be familiar with. <laughs> Um, these were some from a teen program I did a couple years ago. We take a picture, the kid comes in with their favorite book, we take their picture and turn it into a poster which hangs in the library and then they get one and one for their school as well. So of all the kids that finished their reading records, that completed their 20 hours, um, we did a drawing and these are the kids that are going to be hanging on the library wall this year. We did some young kids and older kids as well. So you might be asking if all this had any effect, did they actually do any reading? We had 1,325 kids sign up for summer reading at Hickory Public Library. And we had 5,737 people attended the 172 programs we offered over the eight weeks at both libraries. I repeat, that's 172 programs in eight weeks at the two libraries. <laughs> and for the state library, I have to report how many minutes. That's what the state library wants to know. They want to know how many minutes were read. So the kids who signed up at Hickory Public Library this past summer read 1,192,400 minutes. That's almost 20,000 hours of book time in Catawba County. In eight weeks? In eight weeks. <laughs> and of course, all of this isn't possible without the Friends of the Library and the City of Hickory. So thank you for all you do for the kids in Hickory. Do we have any questions? Uh, how, does this, how does this rank with other cities? Number of minutes and Oh, I think we're best. Well, we know that. <laughs> I kind of wanted you to say it, but I think we know that. I can't imagine um, anybody beat that. This, this number was much higher. Last summer they only read, it was almost the same number of kids, but they only read about 700,000 minutes. So we really jumped up <coughs> this year. What a great program. Yeah. And, and most of that's free, right? Or all of it's free. Oh. Everything's free. Oh. Everything's free. Everything's free. Oh. That's even more. Yeah. That's even better. Yeah. <laughs> and the re response to the free books, and in the past we gave out other prizes in addition. They could either choose a book or a toy. Um, and so this year we just went straight books. No toys, just you get books. You read books, you get books. Hey, that's and what it's, it's been extraordinary. And we had more people redeem prizes than we did when we were giving out toys. Well, in fairness to the taxpayers, it's paid by the taxpayers. Yes. But that's a great bargain for all of us, and as a taxpayer, I'm glad to see my money going in this direction. That's what I tell kids when they come for a school visit. I say, how much does all this cost? You know, and they say, it's free. I say, no, it's not free. Your parents have already paid for it. <laughs> it's prepaid. It's not free. <laughs> right. That was my point. Yes. <laughs>
Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all. Good. Keep up the good work. Thank you. I think I set the next thing down over, back, over here next to the sandwich in this other room. <laughs> next to the sandwich. <laughs> Probably by the mayonnaise. <laughs> Wipe the mustard off it. <laughs> no mustard on it, is it? <laughs> well, we're going to surprise somebody tonight. I'm going to call Hickory's own city clerk, Debbie Miller. Three minutes. <laughs> Somebody else got to take the minutes now. <laughs> this is the lady who keeps me out of trouble with this. Tries. It's not she, calls up, she calls me and says, what she said is not exactly what she meant. What she meant was, don't forget to be at LR for their 125th anniversary when you eat. <laughs> what she said is, Mayor, I have the proclamation for LR 125th anniversary. Uh, Debbie has been awarded the prestigious designation of North Carolina Certified Municipal Clerk from the Association of Municipal Clerks along with the School of Government of UNC Chapel Hill. This award is for achieving its high educational experience and service requirements. She attained her designation through the completion of the Association of Municipal Clerks program conducted in cooperation with the School of Government of UNC Chapel Hill. Ms. Miller joins the 2015 class of municipal clerks from North Carolina who are receiving the state designation. Established in November 5th, 1975, the North Carolina Association of Municipal Clerks promotes educational and professional, professional development for municipal clerks to enhance their knowledge and effectiveness. This is no small task considering the wide array of duties performed by municipal clerks, which often vary from municipality to municipality. The association partners with the North Carolina League of Municipalities, the School of Government, and the International Institute of Municipal Clerks to meet the needs of each individual clerk. The North Carolina Certified Municipal Clerk Program is a five-year designation. Is it that long? Have you been doing this job for five years? <laughs> oh, you got to get research done. How long have you been doing this job? Three years. I was thinking about a year, but okay. Uh, <laughs> together with the International Institute of Municipal Clerks, the association strives to promote educational and professional development to enhance the clerk. Qualifications of applicants are reviewed and approved by the Association State Certification Committee. Let's hear it for the best city clerk in North Carolina. Did we surprise you? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> you look like it. I, I want to say, Mr. Burry put me up to this. <laughs> yes, I did. Okay. Motion of oh, persons requesting to be heard. But I always did it again. Didn't I? Uh, we have a number of people here to who want to speak. I think all of them want to speak about the uh, issue of our special meeting that we had earlier, and it has to do with a uh, with a designation for a thoroughfare on a uh, planning plat for Hickory and Catawba County that calls potentially for a road through Gunpowder Pointed. And uh, so I'm gonna ask each of them to speak. We always tell people, we, we ask uh, 
for three minutes, but we don't want anybody to leave here thinking they have something to say that we didn't hear. With that in order, I'll call on Bergman. Andrea Bergman. Uh, Daniel Blackwell. Please. Um, I'm just down here representing my family and also uh, here as a sort of in support of our neighbors across the lake. Um, we've been aware of this proposed thoroughfare for quite some time. My father developed a subdivision that would fall uh, just to the to the southwest of it. Um, but, but one of my concerns is when I looked at the maps that Mr. Marshall put up on the um, screen is that these lines that have been drawn on the plat that uh, Mrs. Poe has. Likewise, the, the drawing that I sh uh, saw on a map that um, actually showed the bridge coming across the lake that Mr. Marshall had, and I discussed it with him, they appear to me to be pretty arbitrary lines in terms of where they fall on the map. I grew up on that property, and I can tell you that one of the maps he put up there actually showed the bridge going through my father and mother's house, uh, impacting uh, the neighbors all along that subdivision. In reality, uh, Mr. Marshall says that's an inaccurate representation of how the thoroughfare and the bridge would cross the lake. So my concern is that although we are not currently trying to market a property, that down the road, if these maps are still floating out there and they can be a red flag to somebody who might have an interest in something we're trying to market or my neighbors are trying to market, and many of you know those neighbors, they're all good citizens here, uh, that I'm going to be in here uh, asking you to consider removing those lines from the Hickory side of the lake on certain maps that might impact the marketability of our properties. Uh, if, if, the, if the lines are not accurate and they're having a real impact on people's ability to use their property, peaceful enjoyment, develop it, sell it, and they're not accurate, then they should be removed. Or the planning authority should come back in and do a little better job of locating them on the maps so that they more accurately represent where this possible future you know, bridge is going to go. So that's, that's just my, my concern. And um, that's sort of my take on this. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bergman? I thought maybe, okay. Denise Poe. I'm Denise Poe, and I've been here before to speak, and I, I know that you probably, you know, you've heard this before, and I, I wouldn't be here. This is not my personality to handle this kind of business. If my husband were here, he would be handling it, and I would be volunteering at the library. So <laughs> I just wanted to tell you that. Um, I'm fighting against a bridge that I've been told will never come. Why would you want to hold up progress for me, progress for the neighborhood, progress for the buyers that would like to build on this property? In the scheme of things, the cost of that property is not much when you're going to the expense to build a bridge. To me, it's a lot. I need to sell it. Please don't prevent this for something that will likely never happen when it will cause harm for years and years for the people who own the property. And I just ask the council to please write a letter supporting the removal of this easement or removing the um, holdup of us using our property, if you will just write a letter supporting that. 
um, according to Mr. Marshall, that would help. Thank you. Charlie Brady. Thank you, and thanks for not getting too upset with me when I was talking earlier. Uh, I've got to say just first that I, I really enjoy being back to my hometown. Uh, I grew up on the camp, right beside the campus of Lenoran, and, and seeing uh, so many people that I know, uh, it, it's really a pleasure. I have so many good memories of, of this town, and it was a town very good to me and very good to my family. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here tonight for you to have conducted the workshop to learn more uh, about this issue. Uh, it also is informative to me because I'm just now really beginning to, to be involved in this. And I, I, I wanted to just address a couple of things because some of the questions that were asked but not didn't get a chance to answer at that moment, but the mayor mentioned that I'd get to. I don't think re-recording re the plat is one a viable option. For one, as long as that thoroughfare plan is out there, it would be doubtful if you could find Crescent that they would want to re-record it without it as long as that plan was floating out there. Um, but if it is withdrawn and the plat is still in existence, which it would be, it's recorded in the Register of Deeds, a title search, a real estate lawyer doing their search, would see that and it's a red flag. And just like you might find a deed of trust that hadn't been satisfied, you would go and do due diligence to find out, well, well, wait a minute, what is the status of this corridor project right now? And through COG, if it was withdrawn, there'd be a statement that would say, well, that's now off the table. Um, so I wanted to address those just logistical issues for a second. Um, the other thing is that I, I did not know about what Dan said a minute ago, that there may be some inaccuracies about what currently is on a plat, say the one that affects Ms. Poe's property, which was reported in 1991, 24 years ago, that maybe the corridor isn't exactly now in the plan where it was depicted in those old plats. So I would ask one that the council urge uh, COG to do a review of those plats to see, in fact, where they mesh with what the current plan that's floating around is out there. Um, I mean, that might provide some relief to some people if there are inaccuracies. And again, I, I do not know whether there are or not, just listening to what uh, Dan Blackwater said a few minutes ago. Um, so um, this plat, as I said, has been there for 24 years, and we learned tonight that, and I'm sure there was no pun intended, that the bridge was dead in the water since 2002. Uh, so that was like 13 years ago. So how long does this, it's almost like a cloud on title, should it be affecting people like Ms. Poe and other property owners? I would urge the council to help these property owners by voting to have the plan withdrawn. And so we could take that, that uh, letter or recommendation to the Caldwell County Commission and talk to them individually. There's not been evidently a formal vote by that board, and so I would take it that that's not a done deal or uh, the final word on the subject. Uh, and I, I'm confident that they didn't have an informative session as this council did before they even discussed it. So uh, that would be uh, part of my plan after we move forward from here. But thank you very much. Uh, it's been great being back in Hickory. Cammy, C A. Oh, Carrie. <coughs> I am sorry. Carrie's the one that I I know in this group too. Many years. Um, first, I want to thank you all because I learned a lot this this um, informative meeting, and I'm sorry I didn't know I wasn't supposed to speak, but it really was helpful. Um, we built in '98, and we were in phase one, and so one and two was built, and then. Um, later on was when three was built and unfortunately I feel a lot of the folks that built in load in three we were misdirected because I've been told many many times that the toll bridge was gone and so that was no more 
And because we were thriving in the industry, there was not nearly the pressure on banks with money and stuff. And that's what's happening to the folks that we have that are on, on phase three. They have not built homes. That's now being viewed negative toward the bank. So we got some homework to do with Caldwell, but we certainly appreciate any support you can give to these fellow citizens, because if we were in their shoes, we would um, want the help too. So appreciate you listening to us and um, giving us you know, this opportunity. Thank you. Are there any other persons desiring to be heard on this or any other topics? I would uh, be in. Mayor Wright, City Council, Mr. Berry, and Attorney Crone, thank you for giving me an opportunity to voice my personal opinion about what was brought to you this evening by the COG. I too, as a citizen of the city of Hickory, say that once something is in the planning stage, but it interferes with a citizen's right to use their personal property to the fullest capacity. I would hope that this council would do a letter to Caldwell and say to the Caldwell County Commissioners, we have no problems with this being removed from the plans for a widening of Gunpowder Road. Because I am of the opinion that if DOT wants at some point in time to widen that road, then let the state come back in, give fair market value to the property owners instead of holding them hostage. By keeping that information floating out there to who knows to who. So I would encourage my city council members and the mayor to do a letter saying to Caldwell County, we do not object to removing the necessary items that will free up the usage by citizens of Caldwell County in that area. Thank you. Well, I'll make a motion that we discuss this subject, although it's not on the agenda or well, council discussion. Second. Motion by right, second by Patton. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Uh, that's unanimous. I'm going to call Mr. Marshall again. I'm going to be much kinder. Yeah, they yell at me this time. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Marshall, we, he's, he's one of our friends. I, that's the way we, we treat each our friends like this. Uh, you, you're probably saying, well, how do you treat your enemy? <laughs> but. Um, What, what do you think, what is it, what is, what's the downside? Of removing the project? Removing. Um, if you ever want to build that bridge, I guess it's going to be hard to get back in there. I mean, once you remove from the thoroughfare plan, then you're going to have to start all over again. So do you want, you know, do you see a potential of growth in the Hickory, Southern Caldwell region that would dictate needing that bridge in the future? When you say start it over again, like what do we have right now? Do we have uh, how much time and money is in it at this point? Well, it's been on the thoroughfare plan since 1983. Okay, but, so if it comes off, then then ha but things don't they don't go back on in in chronological. It's not it's not as simple putting it back on as it is taking it off. There 
know that bridges could be obsolete in 20 years. Boats of travel. Flying. What's that the last one? Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Mayor, I would move that this council send a letter to Caldwell County Commissioners stating that, that we, although we are not um, petitioning the MPO for removal of the proposed thoroughfare, we have no objection to, their, to them acting to uh, remove any reservation of rights of way that might relate to that proposed thoroughfare um, because we don't know the alignment. There's not many environmental impact studies done. We have no way of understanding where that bridge might be if it's indeed at that point. Um, and the property, it's not as if the DOT owns that property and says we've got to hit it at this point because we're already on that property. So I would, uh, I, I, would I would move that we'd be very clear that we, we are not suggesting the we were, DOT doesn't own any property. DOT owns nothing. That's what I'm saying. We'd be very clear we're not removing so no, the project. There's no reserve right of it. Right, right, correct. We, we're not removing the project, but we're encouraging them to work um, uh, to work with the property owners in Crescent or whatever to um, resolve the issues as it relates to Platt and the top of them. I, you know, I don't, um, yeah. Why wouldn't this group go to the commissioners by themselves? I mean, why should we take a stand first? Because I'm just being supportive, and I just don't like bureaucracy, and don't well, like and, don't like this lady getting and, up. And we, we 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 have heard that this this could impact already people on this side of the river. But, I mean that's fine. I just uh, I can I can only talk about you know the next thirty years when we've got this plan in Northern Hickory by Crawdad Stadium and water and sewer down to MDI, the growth pattern there is going to be tremendous. And people that live in, live in Beaumont to go to these places, it's going to be 25 minutes because unfortunately I was part of a council that didn't have the guts to do anything with Dr. Nero. And I can't see us making two errors. I just, I, I, and, and yeah, I hear you, and I just want to be clear. I'm not suggesting that we are not supportive of that link between 127 and 321. My motion does not include that we recommend that that be removed from the third bridge. So I just wanted to be clear on that. That, as far as I'm concerned, that car can stay on, or that line, as Mr. Blackwell pointed out, which is perhaps a bit arbitrary, can stay, you know, can stay there. Well, then what are we asking the county commissioners to do? I should have jumped in early. Was there a second to this motion before discussion? Is there a second to his motion? No second for discussion. Thanks, John. But so what are we asking the county commissioners to do? I mean, does that not somewhat imply that we're, we want the line to be erased? Or is it just asking them to fix the problem on their end, but leave everything else the same? John, can we do that? Well, I think uh, Mr. Brady made it clear that uh, going in there and arbitrarily erasing those lines that showed where the, the uh, potential corridor could be is not really going to solve their problem. If somebody goes in and does the title research, it's still going to show up. So even if they, you took something to erase those lines, it still doesn't take care of the bigger issue, which is the bridge is still coming through there, which is going to have to be disclosed to uh, any potential property owners in the future. But while we want to help the neighbors, the bridge by being and having us want to reserve that right to have that bridge go across 30 or 40 years from now, it negates kind of your motion. What do we tell the people on 29th Avenue where 29th Avenue is supposed to come be widened in five, seven years? They can't sell the property. Now are we going to let them take 29th widening off to? Because it's going to impact, you know, some property owners? I mean, this is a long-range plan. It's, I mean, I, I feel sorry for these people. I honestly do. Uh, but, I mean, we're here 
thinking about the future plan, thoroughfare plan of Hickory, and ask them to juggle dots on that. We, we, uh, and <clears throat> the the um, the fact that there is a reservoir the words are reservation not dedicated for public use it says on the plan. The fact that those words exist on a plat does not mean um, that the road uh, will have to go there, number one. And if it does go there, it's still, Mrs. Poe's still going to be um, compensated by the North Carolina Department of Transportation. So, um, I can't speak. It's beyond me with regards to title and, it, you know, the title's still clouded. I'm I would have, I don't know about that. I'd have to defer to somebody. Well, I mean, you're right. The travesty is what, what they're holding this code hostage for 30 years. So yeah, yeah. You know, if this doesn't come through, then, you know, you're right. Those impacted property owners sit there for 30 years. Without just compensation. Well, and, 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 and what the reason that, that, it's, that it hangs over their heads is there are, there are people who, well, when people buy their home, they don't buy so, they don't do so with thinking, well, the worst thing that can happen is I'm going to get my money back. Or I'm going to get paid for this. They're buying the home so they don't ever have to move again. That's what they're thinking. And, and that's what hurts when, whether it's on the transportation plan or on that plan, uh, it, it's, it's a reminder that that's been thought of. Now, the fact that my house is not on one of those plats with a line the dotted lines on it doesn't mean it won't happen to me. Oh, you haven't seen the latest plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a solid line. Yeah. So, I would call a question, please, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Do you mind restating? I'll restate the motion that, that we send a letter to the Caldwell County Commissioners or to the authority having jurisdiction over the subdivision of Mrs. Poe's property, stating that we remain supportive of what the Long Range Transportation Plan calls the Eichard Ferry. Grace Chapel. Um, hold on one second. Or you can get me, John. Well, I was told I earlier. Grace Chapel right. Road widening. We uh, remain supportive of that project. Continue to remain supportive of that project, and we encourage uh, them to consider the needs of uh, Mrs. Poe uh, as it relates to the the platting of her property. Does I don't that know make sense? Minute, but I'm not sure. Aren't we being told that that's not going to make any difference? Well, right. we have been told that. I don't know. I don't know that yet, yet right. No. So I'm just, I, I, it's the first, it's the best I got. So <laughs> well, and, and the and is, is, we're just asking them to, to give her some consideration with what she's brought to us. Right, and we did. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it doesn't help, it's probably not going to hurt. Well, and the fact remains that, that by the time, but at this point, it might just absolutely be cost prohibitive to run it through those neighborhoods. This goes right between Morris Ferry and Governor's Harbor, doesn't it? No, it doesn't? No. no. Where's it go? It comes down 29th and goes near uh, where Sally uh, Jordan's property, down by John Clark and down there. Yeah, it's way away from uh, Morris Ferry and Governor's So it's not at 29th Avenue? It is yeah, 29th Avenue. Avenue. Morris Ferry is on snakes 39th. Around. Okay. Uh, so we have the motion and the second. I want to, I want to, if y'all don't mind, bear with me. I just want to think about this before I go. Well, who can answer the question that you said you were told that wouldn't clear anything up? Is that not what you? I, I was just saying, I was just re, uh, saying what one of our speakers. repeating uh, what Mr. Brady said okay. that uh, if you took it off that plat, well, it, that's not even a take into the consideration of trying to get Crescent back involved or re recording. I'm not saying it can't be done, but. He was saying if that line is removed, if somebody does title research on that particular plat, it's still going to show up in the past. I mean, it'll send up a red flag, I suppose. I don't know, you know, are banks not going to loan money on that? I don't know. I'm, I'm going to make a motion that Mr. Brady be allowed to speak. Because he's obviously well, willing you, to. You, you, you. May I do that or I'm getting Well, you, you've got a motion in the second and the question has been called. Did I call the question? Not, I called the question, yeah. Well, you, you're making a motion, we call the question. 
That's all you can do is make a motion. Okay. Yeah, okay. Motion by Mr. Lee. We have a second to call the question. Okay, we're going to continue this discussion. I make a motion that Mr. Brady be allowed to add the clarification that he seems to want to be making. I'll second that. And a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 All of those no. That's unanimous. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Um, what what I, I thought I'd said, and, and with all due respect, Mr. Marshall, I mean, that would be great if the plat could be revised and didn't show any lines. But what I meant was that that's really not likely to happen, that, that the lines are going to remain on that plat. And so uh, what I was saying is someone doing a title search then and goes to see that plat, if the plan was removed, then they would contact COG or DOT and find out that the corridor had, it no longer is in the plan. So I, I hope that clarifies that. The, it, it, yeah, if I could take a magic wand and get Crescent to re-record a plat and there not be any lines on it, that would be great. But I, I just do not think that's likely ever to happen. But, but what to Mr. Lale's point, because you mentioned it in the beginning, that, and, and I'm going back to what Mr. Blackwalder said that was sort of news to me is, and I haven't heard anybody ask Mr. Marshall this yet, are the locations and the lines on those plats indeed exactly where the, uh, the plan shows it to be now? Because that's a real problem. If the plan as it exists today doesn't match up with what's on the plat. I mean, you can see that. I mean, I, so I don't know the answer to that question. And I, I think that's certainly a legitimate uh, inquiry to Bob. Uh, and he, Mr. Marshall may say, no, they're dead on. Uh, but the last point I'll make, since you gave me the opportunity to come back up, is that you're absolutely right. The TOT, nobody owns that property except these individual property owners. And so if that's going to be the exact location of the bridge, they probably have a better crystal ball than anybody else in here. And so that's even more reason it's unfair because you've got this arbitrary plan out there, but who knows where that devil that thing would end up being. John, John, can you answer that? Oh, yeah, John, yeah. yeah. I just wanted to talk about the inaccuracy of the maps. Uh, the plat shows what it shows. That was the uh, DOT looked at the corridor alignment back the best they could when, uh, when that plat, when those subdivisions were being developed. The, an accurate map that he's referring to is a feasibility study that was done in 97, nothing to do with the plats. Uh, the feasibility study shows a corridor that just shoots across uh, the lake and it doesn't, it doesn't dictate exactly where that corridor is going to be. It was, just a, it was just a feasibility study where they connected point A to point B. And when they saw the map, they saw that the alignment of that, the feasibility study was, didn't match what was shown on the plats. So on the Hickory property, it's just a line from point A to point B? On the feasibility study. Yeah. And that was a feasibility study done by DOT in 97. Can, can we request an update to that? Sure. Would that be a logical step? I mean, it's something, uh, I mean, we can, we can absolutely ask for uh, update on that feasibility study. That, that would seem that like maybe the next logical step to me is to request a, an update on that feasibility study before we make any. I, I mean, I'm just personally, I'm just not, I'm not, I understand both sides, but I don't know, like, like Mr. Feisner was saying, that we want to, you know, take that step tonight when we don't really understand, at least I don't understand the full impact of what it is that we're deciding. So I would, I would, well, I'm not going to make a motion. How long would it take to get a feasibility, an update on that? Uh, anywhere from six months to ten years. The reason I'm, personally, the reason I'm wrestling with this is, is not that I want to vote against Mr. Leo's motion. Uh, I, I, I've got no problem with it. I'm just not as, I, I don't want to. You know, I like for people to, if we do something, I like for it to have something other than symbolic value. Right. And that doesn't mean that I'm going to vote against this. 
but and I'm not going to ask you your opinion on this. I should. That's not fair. Um, well, given what we know right now, unless somebody else wants to discuss this, I'm going to call the question. We got a motion by Mr. Lale, second by Mr. Siever. All in favor of sending this letter? Is that right? Please say aye. 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 Let's raise our hands. Okay, we've got two, three, four. We got four, and all opposed, no. We have three. It passes four to three, and I do want to assure you that the three really care about your best interest. Okay? But we're done with that one, right? And I was only joking about 10 years. All right, let's move on. And I want to thank the people from this side of the river and the other side of the river for being here and being so polite and professional and, uh, and for giving us a lot of clarification. Motion to reaffirm and ratify on second reading. Wait a minute, excuse me. I have a motion to approve the minutes of all these I move approval of the minutes from the last meeting. Motion by I'll Mr. Seaver, second by Mr. Lale. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. That's you now. Uh, anything to be moved from the consent agenda? Move to be approved. Second. Motion by Meisner, second by Patton. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. That's you now. Fair or foul? Public hearing. Bill, this Mr. Mr. Atkins? It is. Mr. Mayor, the uh, deputy city attorney just advised me that she believes y'all... Uh, Item Roman numeral 7. Yeah, uh, missed reaffirmation and ratification of second readings. Needs to be uh, addressed. I didn't. Motion to reaffirm and ratify on second reading. So moved. Second. second. Motion by Patton, second by Seaver. All in favor, please say aye. 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 All opposed, no. That's unanimous. Call uh, Police Chief Mr. Tom Atkins to come to the podium. As you know, at your August 4th council meeting, uh, Chief Atkins presented uh, concepts behind a draft ordinance to modify the city's uh, code related to animal and fowl, and uh, that was duly advertised in the in a uh, newspaper of uh, general circulation in the Hickory area on August 21st. And so, prior to opening the public hearing this evening on this ordinance change or proposed ordinance change, I asked Mr. Uh, or Chief Atkins to go ahead and present the item to council. Thank you, Mr. Bear, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Mr. Bear, Mr. Crone. Uh, again, tonight we're going to go over the proposed changes to Chapter 4 of our uh, Hickory City Code. This will probably just be a uh, review of what we heard on the August 4th meeting. So uh, just, to, just for the audience or anybody that may want to speak for or against this, just to go back over it. What we're looking at doing is uh, creating a, the ordinance to restrict animals from uh, the footprint of any property that's going to be used for, or excuse me, any city property that's going to be used for a special event. Uh, the city re requires uh, citizens to fill out a special events application through our development assistance uh, center to inform city staff of events that's, that are occurring in the city. They are required on any city property to uh, notify city personnel resources of needed for that event and also to get the council approval to use city property. Uh, the most uh, most known is our union, use of our Union Square. Uh, some of the events that you know of are the Hickory uh, Farmers Market, the music series under the sales, Oktoberfest, and Hickory Hops. Now this ordinance would not apply to um, city property that uh, city staff would hold special events like uh, the Parks and Recreation Bark Bash or Wolf Walk. Also, other properties could be to uh, could be applied to would be the steps of City Hall or the grassy area over at the Salt Walk. Those would also be fall under this ordinance. Uh, 
Uh, the the, re the re reason why we're doing this is, is first and foremost is the uh, public safety aspect of it. Uh, obviously, we don't want any bites of uh, animal on a human uh, during these events, especially um, that that's first and foremost. Also, we don't want the animal bites on other animals. Uh, we tend to see that uh, animals get aggressive at these events, not only to, um, mostly towards other animals, but uh, we just don't want to see those bites on other animals. Also, the uh, uh, city ordinance requires that any animal be on a leash. So uh, those create trip hazards for the uh, festival goers or any event goers of these uh, events on public property. Again, another uh, area was the uh, human, or excuse me, the animal waste that uh, is potential for animals being at these footprints of these special events. And we've also had the uh, event sponsors request this restriction for uh, their events. As I said at the uh, eight, or August 4th meeting, that we have not, that I can find, have had a bite on that's been reported to the police department on a human or an animal. Talking about the definition of uh, animal, basically we're talking about dogs, cats, livestock, um, any other mammals, birds, reptiles, or fish, amphibians. So mostly we see dogs on these at these events, but it would apply to all animals. We have seen some snakes also. The exceptions to this ordinance would be any uh, animal that is uh, defined under the Americans Americans for Disability Act. Uh, any animal that might be part of the event uh, or the parade, animals owned by law enforcement, or animals uh, that used as a vehicle for hire. We do have, uh, sometimes we have the carriage rides up on Union Square. And then also, there is a provision in the ordinance under Section D that the event sponsor themselves can ask for a waiver and that can be approved by City Council when they approve the special events application. They would have to have the required liability insurance to, uh, to do that. Talked about enforcement of this ordinance. Uh, first and foremost, we would want to educate our public about the change of our, any city ordinance, uh, especially this one, uh, to try to get it out there as fast as we can before these events. Uh, we would hope that the event advertisements would include that on part of their, uh, part of their, part of their flyers. Um, if we would have an event and this was adopted, the uh, police officers and maybe event staff would inform folks that would come into the footprint of the downtown area or wherever the event was be, being held and uh, just inform them of the uh, change of the ordinance. The last, uh, uh, the last issue or that last enforcement uh, of this ordinance, we, would, uh, we could cite somebody within that footprint, but obviously we're gonna use good common sense and hopefully we'll get compliance after these folks would be informed of the change to our city ordinance if, if, uh, if adopted. Talk a little bit about other jurisdictions that have this ordinance. I think uh, our deputy city attorney, she uh, also found Bavard is another one that has uh, this ordinance. This is from a listserv that uh, I sent out before the or August 4th meeting just to see what other jurisdictions have. And this is the reply I got from some of those. Um, we went a little extra step after the July, or excuse me, the August 4th meeting, and our uh, public information office uh, communications director, Mandy Pitts, uh, sent out a informational flyer to our veterinarians, other um, animal type businesses around the area, just to inform them of this possible change. And we hosted two uh, meetings. The one on August 11th was held at the Hickory Police Department which was attended by two individuals, one being a uh, local veterinarian, the other one being a farmer's market board member. <clears throat> Excuse me. The August 13th meeting was held here at City Hall and this council chambers at 10 o'clock a.m. and uh, the farmer's market manager attended that. I did have received one call from an individual who owned a um, animal obedience type uh, business outside the area and said they use these events to, ha to um, help the animals get social skills around large crowds. So he was, he was concerned about if we restricted this ordinance that that would not be available for his clients. Um, 
We did. We're guinea pigs, basically. You say again? <laughs> We're guinea pigs, basically. I'm, I'm, pigs aren't I'm just telling you what the man said, sir. <laughs> <laughs> um, a public hearing was held, or excuse me, a call for on the 18th, and Mr. Berry said it was advertised uh, in the paper. Uh, staff would recommend you adopt this ordinance. I'm available for any questions. Is this ordinance going to be for any activity there uh, in the uh, area that's to be just uh, be enforced? Is it stipulated a certain distance from that area? Uh, I mean, from the actual happening? Uh, um, when uh, organizations fill out a uh, special events application, they put a map of what area they're going to use. And they, you know, it's not, mostly it's hand, hand drawn, so it's not the scale. So um, we would use that as the footprint of the event. Now, obviously, if somebody's you know, walking through and, and it not kind of going into the, the event, but using the sidewalk to go through, we would use good judgment and just let them go through. We try to steer them away from the, the event itself, but there's no, you know, if you're within five feet of this, or, um, again, somebody walking through, we, we would probably could identify that and try to steer them away from the event, but uh, again, you're using good good judgment. Is there any way that some groups can opt out of that, the enforcement of that? Uh... They can ask for the waiver. Um, the event the event applicant can ask for a waiver to uh, uh, remove that restriction. Again, that's uh, okay. you would be so approved. Possibility yeah, you would you could approve that. Um, through even though it might not even be about animals, but. They yeah, I mean, if, they, if they wanted to have it and they wanted to take responsibility for um, for that, they can they can apply for a waiver. You mentioned the farmers market was going on in the um, Oktoberfest, but I believe that Oktoberfest they have at the far end. There's always an animal or um, someone using it to give a dollar and let the kids pet the dog. Would that that if it was part of the event, the, the they it, can do that. Yeah, yeah, can do that. If yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. If, um, <coughs> yeah, if it's part of the event, a petting zoo. If that's part of the event, oh, it would be okay. exempt from the the ordinance. Yes. Uh, will Will you be policing the events <laughs> like the farmers market? Will you have stanchions out and ropes and uh, guards or how? We, we would, just like any event, we would use the appropriate amount of resources for dictating that, well, that event uh, on farmer's market. We don't, uh, we don't normally have the officer stationed at that event. Okay. Uh, we may have somebody walking through just to do a, a property check of the area. Um, that could be a uh, call for service if, if the farmer's market um, a manager or a right. participant would see that. Could, could call us and sure we would respond. And we would hope that... Uh, that the citizens that would maybe bring a, an animal to that area, and then once they're informed that that's no longer uh, appropriate or uh, no no longer accepted by by uh, city code, then they would just move on. So the the people that are putting on the event take the responsibility to tell the people they ca they could. I mean, you know, it just all depends. I think that uh, I think farmers market has has done some of that. Um, uh, any uh, I would imagine some of the Oktoberfest staff would. Um, would be okay with doing that. Yeah. And obviously, if there was a confrontation, I would, I would hope that they would call the, the police and we would respond. Any placards stating the ordinance anywhere? Um, haven't really talked, uh, talked to the public services about that or public works. Um, I guess that uh, the event themselves could place it. I, I know that uh, there's one event that actually puts that on uh, outside their event already, uh, but I guess we could. Uh, consider that as, as a possibility of, to placard. The only problem being like Oktoberfest, there are just so many ways in. <clears throat> Excuse me, and, and you can you can put it on the normal flow where somebody would come in, if, you know, the main avenues, the second streets, yeah. those type of things, but well, we're gonna miss somebody. I've, I've heard more about the farmer's market problem than any of the other ones, and I didn't know if, if there was a way to have a placard either front and back of that that said, you know, that this I, is the ordinance. I bet we can probably consider that. Of course, then somebody might steal the plan. Well, I mean, we'd only put it out, I think, with the, during the event if, if that was. And, and, and I guess if a uh, organization would want to purchase one of those, um, 
Well, um, sure. It could be yeah, you could encourage the, the event to put that in your advertisement. Yeah, yeah that'd be good. Yeah, there, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's businesses all over that, that states, they put up on a yeah. sign and states. Yeah, to get a the, sign company. The second of the, yeah. well, I'm, no, no. <laughs> Sure. That uh, you know, no, they can't trespass, and they cite the or the uh, ordinance okay. or the, excuse, the, the general statute. So I guess they could do that if they would like, okay. within the boundaries of the signed ordinance itself. Right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to open the public hearing and remind folks that we ask people who oppose to this uh, proposal to speak first uh, with the suggested limit of 15 minutes and then people uh, for this proposal would speak for with a uh, suggested limit of 15 minutes. Then there's a chance for five minute rebuttal and sir rebuttal. With that, I'll declare the public hearing open and ask if there's anyone who would like to speak against this proposal. Is there anyone who would like to speak for this proposal? There being no one desiring to speak, I declare the public hearing closed and ask for motion or discussion. I'd make a motion for approval of the ordinance. I'll second. Motion by guest, second by Zagger Rowley. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. That's unanimous. Appointments, I'd like to appoint Cynthia Farrell to the International Council and Beth Bowman to the Public Art Commission as the at-large representative. And uh, I guess since I'm always the one, I'll just go ahead and nominate myself as a voting delegate <laughs> for the uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities meeting. I'll second So we have a motion for those appointments and a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed, no. Mentioning the uh, uh, North Carolina League of Municipalities meeting, it's an excellent opportunity to go just uh, one hour down the road and uh, uh, have an opportunity to uh, get to know with, get to know, and also, uh, I'm to find my words, kind of like LinkedIn, fraternize, I don't know. Network. Network. That's the exact word. That's it. Uh, it is an excellent opportunity. It doesn't cost a lot, and it's only an hour away. Also, I go, I find it very interesting to go through the, uh, through the exposition, which, uh, where they demonstrate products ranging from fire trucks to garbage, truck. garbage trucks to instant communications uh, uh, instruments between residents in the city. And so uh, there's a lot of good reasons to go. I recommend that that everyone gives some thought to go on. Another good reason to go is they do come to Hickory in their rotation. And it helps us a little bit. One of the reasons I go is I don't think it would look very good for me to lobby every six or seven years to have it in Hickory if we didn't support them in Winston-Salem and Greensboro and Raleigh. What were the dates for them? It is October the 12th. Well, that's the business meeting. You see, that is... Uh, it's usually Sunday, Monday, Sunday, Tuesday. Monday, Tuesday. Yeah. I think the business meeting is on Monday. It's usually Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Golf tournament on Saturday. <laughs> it's the 10th through the 13th. Thank you, Clark. 10th through 13th. Perfect. Right up. I've never played in that golf tournament. Whatever we do it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, any matter not on the agenda? Mr. Mayor, I would ask uh, council to consider uh, a matter not on the agenda, and that's a closed session after your general comments, um, to consider 
potential litigation and economic development under General Statute 143.318.11. We had a couple of uh, items come up today that uh, we would like to discuss with Council in closed session. Thank you. Motion to go into closed session. Well, I want to, matters, uh, general comments. I've got uh, one. I went to the Beaumont Business Association meeting several weeks ago and they incorporated the logo with what the city logo is and there they have the street strut starting um, coming in September. So there's 40, 44 businesses so far signed up to participate in promoting the Beaumont area. And also I ran into the Science Center fellow and the they're putting on Portal to Science that's helping the Caldwell Social Services, Burke, Alexander, Catawba, and Catawba Public Health to get um, disadvantaged children as access to the Science Center. So if you know anybody, they're pushing really hard to get everybody to have access there. Right. Well, today, I was afforded the opportunity to read a proclamation honoring Lenore Ryan on the occasion of their 125th anniversary. It continues all year. Yep, I bought that. The, uh, uh, this year they have a record enrollment in their three campuses. They have a record number of freshmen. They have 500 student athletes. And they have 50 international students. And uh, so we're very proud of the Lord Ryan and the contribution that they've made and are continuing to make. Uh, tonight, Benton Blunt from Granite Falls is on America's Got Talent. Cast a vote for Motion to go to close session. One more thing on the Lenore Ryan thing. I don't know if I'll cover it but uh, we're one of the top six college towns, small college towns in New York County because of our relationship between the three and the run. So, honestly, on social media, probably a few of some of the things we've spoken. Catch it. Great article in Our State Magazine. Motion to go to closed session? Second. Second. Motion by Patton, second by Seaver. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, no. Yes, you can. Plenty of confidence. Plenty of confidence.